So I'm here with the what on it on? And uh, Msitu. Msitu. Msitu, that is his name. So my name is Rama. And I'm here. Uh, one one knows telling me a story about uh, what happened if someone actually dies in the Hadza community. So it was very fascinating for me and I'd love to share it with you. So one one no. Mtu akifa hapa inakuwaje za mpindi ya nyuma wakanti when what is what happens someone dies that one wakati wa kale wa zamani wa kale walikuwa wanaua nyama wakati mtu amekufa wanamuacha kwenye nyumba hii akimkuta simba pale anakuta na nyama yake analiwa kwa hiyo kwa kwa mtu akifa wanamuacha hapo hapo wanaua na nyama wanaweka pembeni hapo hapo ili simba akija anakula yeye na mtu ndio na nyinyi mnakuepo hapo hapo mnaondoka tumeshahamba tunamwacha ah eh. okay. so what happened is uh, what is tried to say um, many years ago i think now uh, their life has changed a little bit due to the modern style that is always keep coming in um, if someone dies uh, they will leave the camp and they will leave that dead person on that particular area and what do they will do they will go out hunting they try to kill uh, one of the big animal a, any particular animal a prey they bring it back and they'll put it next to that dead body so what happened is, is to attract the aid of the lion that will come over later on and eat the meat and the dead body at the same time so they can clear the things up and for the Hadza, they will be moved out moved far away from that particular area or that community so that's what you do Okay, so he's saying that due to the uh, modernization nowadays, they do the barrio and they will gather around. Uh, so it's not the same as how it used to be many years ago. So now they will actually make a proper uh, funeral and then they will come as a community to celebrate and get rid of it, get done. So, the thing has changed now compared to many years ago. So slowly, I think it is culture is vanishing. The, uh, I, would, I would say that because um, it's not the actual, if you compare like 20, 30 years ago, 30,000 years ago to today, the life has changed a little bit in terms of lifestyle. But yes, that's that are, that are how it is. And it's good to know this story. No, no, no. How do you get water? So what Mungu is saying is like nowadays it's not that easy to actually find some water anywhere where close by simply because encroachment is is coming up so fast that different tribes are coming in and building up different houses so they are taking a lot of the lands and not so nowadays uh, to find a place where there's water that is a little bit of problem because the area has been taken uh, and this will make it very hard for them so you can see that it's one of those hardest things that they could ever uh, be experiencing when they are here <laughs> they have drunk enough water now. They take the rest back to the farm, of which they use the calabash like what they have, together with the baobab fruits that they make it as a cup. So they can have water back to the family. What a simple way of 
of life for living. Ah! I'll this is an easy know. way of it's living, my friend. Yes. It's like. So is this what they do all the time? Like, if they want to drink water, they come down to the river bed like this and drink it from there. Okay. And they come to fetch water by using the calabash. Yeah, I saw the calabash and also they are using the uh, uh, balba fruit. They cut it and make a little hole look like a cup. And now they are like fetching water with it and just pouring into the calabash. And so that was the whole story about the Hadzabe hunter-gatherers funerals. It is something that I actually didn't know before how it works, but now I've got the glimpse on how the funeral works. So before that, I will for the next, I mean the coming video after me talking, I think I'm gonna show you guys again the true life style of the naturalism of the Hadza um, on how they make iron bows and everything about that. It's the start of a new day for the Hadza, starting in the same way it always has. Men gathered around the fire waiting for the sun to rise, the same routine that's seen them through the last 50,000 years. They enjoy the warmth, a the smoke, they tell a story or two of hunts gone by. The Hadzabe are one of the oldest surviving cultures on earth and one of the very last true hunter-gatherers on the planet. The traditions have remained largely unchanged for thousands and thousands of years and today they live their ancient lifestyle hunting and gathering in a small area on the banks of Lake Yassi in Tanzania. Today I'm going to explore the true art of Hadza arrow making from the beginning to the end, including their famous poison arrows made from the deadly desert rose plant. But before that, a short smoke break. Smoking is an extremely integral part of the Hadza daily lifestyle and it's serious business. It's a communal affair and great pains are taken in the preparation of the handcrafted sandstone pipe that gets passed from hunter to hunter. Smoking's never rushed and it's only after each man has had his full that the day actually begins. Hadza have essentially got four different kinds of arrows that they will use for different purposes. The first and most commonly used arrow is specific for the hunting of birds and it's called dunduwako. A corn cob is often attached to the end of the arrow and the arrow tip is not sharpened. They're incredibly adept with this arrow and are capable of taking small birds out the air with it. A feat that's quite incredible with a bow and arrow. Listen as Nimako explains the arrowheads and the different types of birds they use it on. It's incredible to listen to him describe the bird species specifically with their calls as well as their mannerisms. <laughs> Oh, 
The second arrow is a metal broad headed arrow that is used for warthogs and bush pigs, as well as small antelopes such as duck duck. The third arrow type is also a broad headed metal arrow, but this time with sharp barbs, used specifically for the hunting of baboons, which was one of the Hudza's favorite prey species. These sharp barbs make it impossible for the baboon to pull the arrow free and then making it less likely for the baboon to escape. Last but not least is the famous poison arrows. This is an incredibly effective toxin that is derived from the pulp of the desert rose plant. I'll go into greater detail in the actual process of extracting and making of the poison later in the video. This poison is effective within 30 minutes depending on the size of the animal hunted. The Hadza are able to take animals as big as a giraffe with this extremely toxic poison. And the poison and the arrow are very valuable resources to the Hadza, so they'll only use them when it's absolutely necessary. Every day flows to a similar routine for the Hadza men. After they've enjoyed the fire and the smoke, they'll head out for the day's hunting. Hadza can often cover huge distances in search of meals. They patiently stalk through the bush searching for every available opportunity. Nothing is ever passed up by the Hadza. They focus a lot of attention on the hunting of birds. Birds of all sizes from sunbirds to guinea fowl, all of them on the menu. Their skill as archers is absolutely incredible. They are more often than not able to make shots on small birds from a distance of 20 meters or more, and can even take birds in flight out of the air, which is incredible. Energy and opportunity is never wasted, and so when they pass by a bush that's used for the making of their arrow shafts, they'll stop and collect what is needed before they carry on with the hunt. A species of grewia or raisin bush found in their area, which is called Kongolobe in Ahadza, is the preferred material for their arrow shafts. Along with the arrow shaft, the bush has also edible berries that can be eaten, but also used to trap birds by chewing it into a sticky pulp that small birds get stuck in while trying to feed on the sweet berries. The straightest branches are chopped to size and then peeled before they are bundled together and taken back to camp to be prepared into their arrow shafts. Being at Zabe is a team sport. They hunt together, they gather together, they eat together and they make arrows together. Once back in camp in the afternoon, they get together to begin the process of straightening out and hardening the arrow shafts that they collected during the day. Just by watching them, you can see the craftsmanship that's been passed down from generation to generation. They carefully use their knives to shave off all the excess material, making the arrows a uniform thickness. Having perfectly straight arrows seems like an essential to having them fly true. And the Hadza make this look very, very easy. Once they have the shaft the correct thickness, they will sharpen a point on it for testing and begin the final straightening and hardening process. Gathered around the fire again, they place the new shafts into the fire before using their teeth to straighten out any kinks in the shaft. 
The process of placing the shafts into the fire also removes a lot of the moisture within the shaft, thereby hardening it. Once they're happy with all of the new shafts, they'll move on to the final stage of the arrow making process. And that's the fletching. The environment that surrounds the Hadza provide absolutely everything they need to sustain their lives. For the last 50,000 years, the Hadza have honed their bushcraft to near perfection. And this is perfectly shown in the method of making arrow fletches. <laughs> making fletches for arrows is an extremely finely detailed task. And the Hadza once again make it look so simple. The fletches themselves are made from bird feathers, either the tail and wing feathers of a hornbill or the wing feathers of a guinea fowl. The fletches are secured in place using tendons from antelope hunted by the Hadza. The tendons are stripped into thin strips and are chewed so that they can be worked easily. The tendon easily wraps around the arrow shaft and secures the fletches in place. And once they dry, they tighten to hold them permanently in place. As with all craftsmanship of this level, individuality is key and each hunter has his own signature markings and methods that can identify his specific arrows. This will come in handy proving that your arrow is the one that brought down the bush pig for the entire camp to feast on, elevating you to hero status for the day. Ten thousand hours. That's the number of hours of repetition it is said is needed to be able to achieve proficiency at any task. If you've hung around a Hadza with a bow and arrow in his hand, you'll soon realize that they have many, many multiples of those ten thousand hours. The bows almost seem parts of them and they seem to have such ease with their accuracy. Once the shafts and fletches are ready to go, they're given some quality control tests at the camp's own archery range. Each man tests his own arrows and slams them into the soft wood target about 20 meters away. Now that each of the hunters is happy with their arrows, the only thing left for them to do is to engage in a bit of bartering to secure the valuable arrowheads. For that, the Hadza are going to have to visit the local blacksmiths, the Datorga tribe. The Datorga are a pastoral tribe that moved into the area of the Hadza as late as the 19th century. They brought with them the art of blacksmithing. And it's with them that the Hadza trade in order to get their essential metal arrowheads. The Datorga smelt iron ore down using local coal, and then they work that smelted iron ore into the metal arrowheads. Nowadays, however, it's a little bit easier and they take advantage of having access to things like large nails, and that they hammer, file and sharpen into the arrowheads that the Hadza need. The Hadza will barter with whatever they have in order to trade their goods for the arrowheads. 
Today, Nimako heads off to the nearest Datoga village with some meat in the hope of trading it for some new arrowheads they need for the arrows that they collected during our morning hunt. They negotiate for a number of barbed arrows for the meat they brought and with the deal done, they head off for the long walk back to the camp. This brings us to the final type of arrow and definitely the most intriguing one. For this arrow, the Hadza will require poison and for that, we'll have to travel to the edge of Lake Iyasi in search of the famed Desert Rose. Poison arrows carry such a mythological interest for us as humans. Whether it's South American tribes using poison dart frogs or sand bushmen using agacanthera roots and beetle grubs, it piques our interest in the most extreme way. The ancient wisdom that enables us to create toxins that are capable of bringing down the largest of animals mystifies us deep into our ancestral consciousness. For the Hadza, this poison is created from the pulp of the desert rose. Desert rose is a fibrous shrub from the Denium genus. It's found in the region of Lake Iyasi on the large basalt outcrops of the area. Once a suitable shrub is found, the Hadza will begin to chop into the heart of the shrub using a traditional axe. Another hunter will prepare a sharp-ended stick with a blunt end for digging and pulping the shrub's fibrous material. After enough pulp is obtained from the fibrous material, the liquid is then squeezed into a pot for collection. A lot of pulping and squeezing is required to attain enough liquid for a number of arrows. One litre of liquid will only be enough to make two poison arrows. The toxin of this plant acts on the nervous system. Once it is in contact with the bloodstream, it will begin to act immediately, eventually causing breathing to stop. Even in this liquid form, it's deadly. And if the Hadza were to have any open wound on his hands while handling it, it's likely to be fatal within an hour. After enough of the liquid has been gathered, the Hadza will prepare a fire for the final stage of the poison's preparation. Fire forms a central role in all that is Hadza. Much like it is throughout the rest of Hadza life, fire is vital in the final poison making process. The desert rose liquid is rapidly boiled and reduced down, darkening as it reduces. Eventually it reduces down to a tarry, almost rubber-like consistency. The boiling and reducing down serves two purposes. Firstly, the reduction strengthens the concentration of the toxin and the chemical process of boiling the liquid changes its composition, making it more toxic. But lastly, it makes it easy to apply all of the poison to the arrowhead itself. The poison is then mixed with some ash and then molded into the base of the arrowhead. Great care is taken in attaching the molded poison onto the arrow, making sure it is spread consistently, enabling it to be most effective once it enters the animal. One slip, one misplaced finger, and that could mean the end. And that's that, all said and done, from the pulp of a harmless looking shrub to an incredibly deadly poison in a matter of an hour. In the hands of a Hadza, an absolute deadly weapon. What comes next is the culmination of all these things, everything that is Hadzabe, the ancient wisdom that has been passed down from generation to generation, the deep and intimate understanding of their environment around them, the pure craftsmanship of making arrows from only what can be sourced around them. All of this would be useless without the mind-boggling tracking abilities and their incredible archery skill. allowing the Hadza to take that one opportunity, all to provide himself and his family with a meal fit for a Hadza. And tomorrow starts all over again.